My name's Marie. I'm one of the lead nurses at the GMSA, and I just wanted to quickly do some housekeeping um, details for you. So we have deactivated people's cameras and microphones just in order to be able to help us then proceed through the session quite swiftly and to time. If you do have a question, um, we would welcome questions. So please raise your hand using the, the icons below. And also that this session is for NHS staff only. And we're also going to be recording this event. And that way, if you have been unable to join us this evening, you will be able to um, watch the future recording. So welcome, and I'm going to pass you over to Dr. Jackie Cook, our clinical director here at the Northeastern Yorkshire GMSA. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Marie. Um, so welcome everybody to this webinar. We are going to spend the next two hours talking about early cancer diagnosis with patients with Lynch syndrome. We hope to cover quite a lot of different aspects of that. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, there's a summary of what we hope to cover in these next few hours. So we're going to start off with an overview of the uh, National Lynch Syndrome Project. So this is a project that's taking place over the whole of England. And for the northeastern Yorkshire, that is led by um, Dr. Sally Lane, who is going to um, be explaining this to you, and myself as the clinical director of the GMSA. Also going to include in that bit a bit of an explanation of what the GMSA is and what it is setting out to achieve. Then going to hand over to Jill. Jill is the nurse director of the northeastern Yorkshire GMSA. And she's going to talk to you about the Lynch nursing team that we have just appointed and what their role is in our transformation project. Then we go to Marie, who's just been talking to you, and she's going to explain a little bit about the engagement and education webinars that she's been involved with in the Northwest and is hoping to bring over to the Northeastern Yorkshire. Then we're going to hand over to um, Dr. Liu, who is um, works up in the northern region of our area, and she's going to talk to you about mainstreaming Lynch syndrome testing. So about the testing that is taking place currently, how we're trying to influence that and where we hope to go with that. Then we're on to Dr. Rundle, who's going to talk to you about the gynae side of Lynch syndrome and look at the MDT audits that we've been doing, looking at MMR testing for the gynecological cancers. And then finally, Sally and I are going to talk you through and hopefully stimulate a discussion on a regional expert network for Lynch syndrome for the northeastern Yorkshire. Um, and just think about ways in which we can put in place uh, a, a forum which is available for everybody working with patients with Lynch syndrome, where we can discuss um, and get advice from one another and learn from each other. So go on to the next slide, please. So we're going to start off by just giving you an overview of the National Lynch Syndrome Project. So next slide. So in order to do that, you need to explain a little bit about some of the abbreviations that we are using and explain a little bit about the um, GMSA or the Genomic Medicine Service Alliance. So this, these are bodies that have been created by the Genomics Unit of uh, NHS England. And there are seven GMSAs across the country, which you can see uh, from the diagram, the, the geography. Um, the Northeastern Yorkshire is the second biggest, and we cover a population of about 9 million patient, people and patients. Uh, they match, they're the same geographical footprint as the laboratories. And a, a few years before the development of the GMSAs, there was a laboratory reorganisation. And Laboratories were combined into what are called GLHs or genomic laboratory hubs. 
So within northeastern Yorkshire, we have three genetic laboratories in these Sheffield and Newcastle that now form a single GLH in northeastern Yorkshire. The reason behind all of this reorganisation and rationalisation of services is to try and attempt to achieve better equity of access to genomic testing. So there has always been a concern that it is easier to get genomic tests in some areas than others. It's easier to um, get them if you uh, live in an area with a big teaching hospital than if you live in a rural area with a distant district general. And so what the purpose of creating the alliances was, was to bring together all the genomic services within a region and aim for equity of access. So that no matter where you live, you get the same um, ability to access genetics. It is also about um, driving the mainstreaming of genomics. So traditionally, genetics test and genetic testing has been done within the clinical genetic services. But as more and more testing becomes available and it becomes more and more relevant to mainstream practice, it really isn't possible any longer for all genetics to just be done within clinical genetics. And so what we are aiming to try and do is introduce diagnostic genetic testing into mainstream services so that we um, cut down a little bit on the time of the patient journey so that they may be able to access their genetic testing earlier and it is done at the same by the same team that is involved in the rest of their management. In order to do that, that is a massive um, a requirement for transformation of the NHS workforce because not many people have done genetics or genomics as part of their training. And although we're not asking them to do complex genetics, not at all, it does require a little bit of um, upskilling in terms of genetic knowledge. And again, one of the jobs of the GMSA is to help with that. We also are one of our other aims is to drive clinical transformation and research so that we bring genomics into routine work and we need to demonstrate that actually it is the patient's benefit. Um, and in order to do that, also, we need to make sure that we are um, including patients within clinical research work at all possible. The clinical genetic services are not part of the GMSA as such. They st are still three standalone services, but they work very closely together within the region and they work very closely with the GMSA itself. Next slide, please. So I think I probably covered that. So what are so when we talk about alliances, what are the other groups that we work with? Um, so I've mentioned the laboratory, I've mentioned the three clinical genetic services within the area. We work closely with primary care. There is primary care lead within the GMSA. Um, we also work very closely with the pathology networks and Sally is our pathology lead. We work closely with all four cancer alliances in the region and we've um, been steadily building links with the cancer alliances over the last two years. And we now have a number of joint projects with cancer alliances and that also includes the Lynch Transformation Project. As the ICS has come on board, we're making links with them and contacting our partners in those systems so that um, because they are also uh, interested in, in bringing genetics into a more mainstream setting and we're working with them to do that. We also have strong links with the AHSNs and we have joint projects with them, including one on familiar hypercholesterolemia. And we are also building up links with the universities and also specialist care networks. Next slide, please. As well as the infrastructure of the GMSA, so these are people within the post that make all this work, um, we have a number of transformation projects. Some of these are national, and um, Lynch is a national project, so all seven GMSAs are involved in that project. The other national projects are pathology, the Pathology Accelerator project, so bringing genomics into pathology and how that is going to work. There's a project on monogenic diabetes, one on um, cell-free DNA, particularly in, with lung cancer. Um, 
this project uh, on RNA sequencing and one on sudden cardiac death involving the coroners. Our own project in northeast and Yorkshire is nursing and midwifery transformation, and we will keep coming back to that during the course of the next few hours. We also have some local projects, and our local projects in northeast and Yorkshire are looking at fetal maternal pathways, rare disease case finding, and primary care. And also for me, you have cluster reunion, which we're doing jointly with the AHSMs. We have completed a pharmacogenetics pro project on DPYD so that we ensure that everybody who is uh, going to need drugs such as 5-fluorouracil is tested for DPYD mutations that might make them hypersensitive to that drug. And we also completed a digital DNA project. So I'm going to hand over to Sally now to give you some much more specific information about the National Lynch Syndrome project, which will then set us up for the rest of the evening. Thanks, Jackie. Um, apologies, I'm going to start on my phone, but hopefully by the end I'll have made it back to my computers, which is just mucking about at the moment. So um, the National Lynch Syndrome project is broken down into sort of five main areas. And just to explain a little bit more about where what we're doing tonight will link into those particular areas. Uh, next slide, thanks. So the workforce transformation is working around that main goal, embedding genomics in routine clinical practice. and. Um, Tonight, we're particularly look, concentrating on the regional development of more robust training so that everyone gets a kind of standardised training across the GMSA and with the Cancer Alliances and Cancer Team peer support. And that's what um, basically Marie and Jill will be talking about later. Next slide. So the diagnostic pathways, this is about bringing the Lynch syndrome advice, which is at the moment nationally for colorectal cancer and for endometrial cancer into uh, mainstream practice. In the terms of the actual mainstreaming, as Jackie explained, that's more the germline testing and assessment actually happening within your cancer MDT, as it has been working towards in ovarian and um, breast cancer already. And there'll be presentations on that. And then we're trying to make that robust, systematic and measurable. And lots of people have been starting on local audits in their MDTs and the specialty MDTs. And we'll hear one uh, which has been completed today um, from Gateshead. In terms of the expert centres, uh, as Jackie's explained, we'll try and um, bring that discussion further on. It's quite complicated and there isn't um, long term funding identified yet, but we hope that we can push that on a little bit. Next slide. And these are two things we won't be talking about tonight. Um, the National Registry Project, uh, the overall national project is very much working with N the Cancer Stats, that's NDRS and other items to have actually brought in a screening programme for Lynch syndrome. So patients who are going to be identified in increasing numbers by bringing this programme online will be fed into a national screening programme for um, colorectal cancer, um, where that's been a little bit more ad hoc at the moment. So they'll just get an automatic call and recall, which is super. And then the other area is extension of testing to other tumours. So people who've been researching or doing sort of R&D projects and developing the testing beyond colorectal and endometrial cancers. And in NEY, we've been participating with sebaceous skin tumours, urology and gastric tumour projects to look at how to test in those areas. I think that's the last slide, Marie. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, and also to Jackie. So hopefully everybody, um, both Jackie and Sally, have set the scene for this evening's um, discussion. If anybody does have a question that they'd like to um, pose to either Sally or Jackie at the moment before we proceed on to our next speaker, which will be um, Jill Moss, our Nurse Director for the North East in Yorkshire GMSA. So if anybody does have any questions, would you like to raise your hand now, please? 
We've got no takers. That's absolutely fine. So ne next slide, please, Emma. OK, so without further ado, Jill, it's over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. That's great. So, um, yes, I'm Jill Moss and I'm the nurse director for the North Eastern Yorkshire GMSA. And um, as Jackie alluded to about the GMSAs, the remit for the nursing midwifery part of the programme is to embed genomics into the current nursing workforce. So if we go to our next slide. So within the Lynch project, um, what we needed to do um, and what we are in the process of doing now is to embed the Lynch pathway with education and training across all the four cancer alliances in the region. The, uh, we were primarily given 0.5 of a whole time equivalent to Ban Nurse, um, which was financed from St Mark's London, which is the centre of excellence in London. Um, and this was purely to mainstream the Lynch syndrome testing. However, um, 0.5 of a whole time equivalent to cover the whole of our region basically wouldn't be enough and we wouldn't be doing the Lynch service any justice. So we approached the four cancer alliances and they ger generously have topped up um, the funding and to be fair we are now in a position where we have 2.8 whole time equivalents to work across the region which is great and we had our third candidate who just started in post this week. Um, we have Rebecca Foster who is 0.8, we have Amy Sanderson um, who is a full time and commencing in post like, post like I said this week is Karen Westaway who is a full time equivalent member of staff and they will each be assigned a region to embed the Lynch pathway. Next slide please. So the remit of the nurses um, currently um, following a full, they are follow, following a full and comprehensive induction program. So this is where they are have introductions to the GMSA staff and also to the key people along the pathways and within the cancer alliances in order to get up to speed with what's currently going on within each cancer alliance. We are fully aware that some can, one of the cancer alliances is more ahead than the others. So we need to do a baseline to find out what's needed and what's required and then we can measure the beginning of the program versus the end of the program to see what a difference and what impact we have made. They're also going to be introduced to the consultant geneticists, the genetic counsellors, they're also going to spend time in the clinical setting to see what conversations take place with patients and then they can have the discussions with the nurses out in the clinical areas to replicate what's going on in the consultant setting out with the patients. We're also going to be setting up reef webinars, um, which Marie will come on to later. We also want teaching packages in place for new starters so that um, at the end of the project, we have a rolling programme of um, induction for new starters into each of the cancer alliances so that they have the training right at the very start and they can carry it with them throughout their duration in post. We also want to increase the number of Lynch champions in the MDTs and this is to mainstream the Lynch testing within each of the endometrial and colorectal um, MDTs. And I think that's my last slide if we move on. It is. So I will now hand you over to Marie, who is the lead nurse within the North Eastern Yorkshire GMSA. Thanks very much, Jill. So um, welcome back everybody and um, to the next little section which is my own and this is about how we as the nursing workforce within the the GMSA engage really and um, facilitate education. So what we're planning on doing is developing a series of webinars that are focused for regional engagement and education forum. So we um, just call it for um, short reef webinars. OK, next slide, please. So one of the most important things that we recognise is that we as the GMSA and the nursing workforce are certainly not coming in to, to start saying how things should be done because you're all 
in established uh, services and already running uh, very successful programs of work and things. So what we're trying to do is to be able to facilitate engagement and education whereby we're able to signpost and influence um, training and education within the main Lynch syndrome training packages that are being led out by St Mark's in London. So this is not very this is not about reinventing any kind of training but it's about facilitating um, the, the, the clinical workforce across the northeastern Yorkshire to engage in the training programme. There's a series of four or six online modules and they give a great basis on introdu introducing the individual to how to go about embedding genomics for Lynch within the clinical arena. Next slide please. So the principle behind the Regional Engagement and Education Forum is that we always start with a patient story and the patient story, it, it, it centres us and it, it, it makes us clear about why we are so emphatic about being able to, to spread the word and the success of what embedding Lynch syndrome testing will do in endometrial and colorectal um, pathways. So we start with a little video of um, a patient story who has been affected by Lynch syndrome and the impact that that has had on that individual, their family and their surrounding um, wider family. And we are really, really lucky to have the patient story from the chair of Lynch Syndrome UK, which is a charitable organisation that you can all signpost your patients and relatives to as um, an a really, really valuable resource. We also then focus over onto the professionals. You know, what does it mean to be able to adapt to the, the policy changes and the key drivers nationally? And then practitioners, we actually go through um, mainly focused on the nursing workforce about how to embed Lynch syndrome testing within the clinical pathway. Next slide, please. So literally what we're trying to do with the reef strategy is to engage our workforce so that we've got an educated workforce that have undergone standardised um, training that's come from the national team and that is in an, in an order to be able to enable um, the clinical nurse specialists and the champions to move forward. So and just as that all comes together, this next slide just demonstrates that. So, you know, at the centre of everything that we're doing within the nursing uh, workforce with our fabulous Lynch um, nurse educators who have just recently joined us is that Regional Engagement and Education Forum. Next slide, please. So. Um, we are now going to go, we're slightly ahead of schedule, which is great news. And we're now going to go over to our North East and North Cumbria colleague, Dr. Payson Lu. Payson, would you like to take control? Okay, thank you, Marie. Uh, can you see my control, yeah? Okay, so my name is Pei San Lu. I'm a consultant pathologist at uh, Newcastle RVI. I'm also the colorectal Lynch champion for Newcastle as well as the regional Lynch syndrome project in Northern Cancer Alliance. So today in my talk, I will be presenting the Northeast North Cumbria colorectal Lynch syndrome progress. Some key, um, sorry, so, yeah, so some key uh, facts here. So colorectal cancer is the second highest cause of cancer death worldwide. And one in six of these have mismatch repair defect. One in five of these have Lynch syndrome. And this is the point that I need to point out that Lynch syndrome is a germline mutation, meaning that it runs in families. Patients tend to be younger when they develop colorectal cancer and they have increased risk of developing other types of cancers. For example, uh, gynecological cancer, upper GI tract and so on. 
Now, in 2017, NICE produced a guideline uh, referred to as DG27, which states that all newly diagnosed colorectal cancer should be screened for Lynch syndrome, either using MMR IHC or MSI testing. And both of these screening tests are comparable. Uh, and just to point out that in summer 2021, uh, the National Lynch Syndrome Oversight Group project was formed to look at the uh, testing pathway and how to increase the testing rate. These are some figures from uh, national figures from 2019, which showed that in 2019 of all colorectal cancer, 43% of patients were tested for MMR status, which me meant that 57% of patients, percent of patients were failed to test. Um, just to point out that a lot of the rate figures that you're going to see in my presentation are from NDRS. So acknowledgement to Dr. Fiona McNoronal and also Kevin Monahan in the National Lynch Oversight Group. This is another table showing the MMR testing rate across multiple um, cancer alliances. And you can see the blue bars are the ones where patients are being tested for MMR status. Grays are the ones that they are not being tested. So we are not actually testing every single patient despite the NICE guideline of saying that we need to test 100% of patients. Northern Cancer Alliance, we are right up here where we are failing to test more than 50% of our patients. So this is a image that I have illustrated to try to show you in the most simplified form of what should be happening to our colorectal patients. So at the start of the pathway, you can see that when we diagnose colorectal patient, we should be offering the first initial screen test either with MMR or M MSI. And depending on the results of the MMR or MSI testing, we may have to offer them a second arm of testing, which is either with BRAF or MLH1 methylation. And using these two sort of arm screen tests, you will eventually pick up cases where they are high risk of uh, going to have uh, Lynch syndrome. Now, these are the group of people that you need to be as a minimum, referring to clinical genetics so that they can be offered a formal Lynch gene testing. Because we know that MMR and MSI, they are just screening tests. They are not 100%. You still need to undergo a formal gene testing to determine if the patient has Lynch syndrome or not. And once they are confirmed to have Lynch syndrome, they need to have uh, appropriate follow-up for the index patient, but also appropriate follow-up and cascade testing for their extended family members. Now, again, figures in red are from NDRS, showing you that these are the failures in our pathway. As I've stated in the beginning, that we are failing to test 50%, 57% of our patients. They are not being offered the initial screening test. And as you go further down the pathway of these group, only 46% were giving up, given follow-up tests of the second arm, even though they are eligible for testing. And if you go uh, look into details of this group of people, so depending on what kind of abnormality they have in their MMR testing, so if they have abnormality in MSH2, 6, PMS2 deficiency, these are the group that you need to automatically offer germline testing. But NDRS data shows that 71% of these are being failed to offer um, formal gene testing, even though they are eligible. And then for the groups where it is MLH1 promoter unmethylated, 64% are not being offered the germline testing. But that's not the only problem. The other problem that we have is that the time it takes for the patient to be diagnosed colorectal cancer and for them to go down this pathway to be identified as high lynch high risk lynch and to undergo a uh, formal genetic testing, they have to wait 477 days in order to find out whether or not they have Lynch syndrome. And we know that majority of the cases where they are picked up to have high risk Lynch, most of them do not have Lynch syndrome. So you can imagine that a patient is waiting for more than a year with a lot of anxiety only to be told a year later that they do not have Lynch syndrome. So these are the problems that we are experiencing. Now, let's just look at more tangible data relating to Northeast and North Cumbria. So in 2019, our population for colorectal cancer is around 2,200 to 2,300 cases. And we know that we are not testing more than half of our patients. So that's where our uh, difficulty is. 
And as uh, was pointed out in the initial of the um, presentation, we know that uh, Northeast North Cumbria is a huge geographical area up in the Northeast and North Cumbria. We have eight NHS Foundation Trusts. And each of these NHS Foundation Trusts have multiple hospitals. So you can imagine if you have a huge geographical area with multiple uh, variation services, they are bound to have, you're bound to have some gaps in your services. Um, now, the next group of slides that I'll be showing are the positive changes that we have managed to achieve in the last year. And I would like to point out that the reason why we are able to achieve these changes is because of the close partnership and engagement that we have between multiple groups. And that includes the GMSA, which is led by Sally and Jackie, Northern Cancer Alliance, led by Katie Elliott, Sarah and Andy, and then as well as our tumor board group, which is led by Peter Coyne and team. We have also uh, recruited seven local leash champions, which is scattered uh, across the eight NHS Foundation Trusts, as well as working to in partnership with our existing colorectal MDT leads. So where are our gaps, okay? So if I were to bring you back to the pathway that I illustrated in the beginning, if you look at the beginning of the pathway, we know that we were testing, you know, only, uh, you know, less than half of our patients. And in order to target this gap, we need to know who our stakeholders are. And in this beginning of the pathway, the stakeholders here are the cellular pathology laboratories, essentially the pathologists here. So we had to engage with all the cell path labs in the eight NHS Foundation Trusts and to find out why exactly they are not testing the patients. It could be the awareness of, you know, the not being aware of the NICE guideline, not being building it into the reflex practice. Now, I put here about Funding. Now, funding is contentious because when NICE uh, roll it out to say that, you know, we need to test all these patients, funding was not addressed. So eventually, you know, cell path lab had to absorb this cost uh, in order to get the patients tested. But by the bottom line is that by addressing, you know, your stakeholders here, we're able to close down the gaps in this location. Now, the next part of the pathway, as you can see in the illustration here, it gets a bit complicated because it depends on what kind of abnormality you have in the testing. So what we did is that we knew that at the beginning, multiple trusts were doing different things. So MMR facility was only being offered in Newcastle and in Gateshead, but the rest of the DGHs did not have these uh, testing. And then MSI was only offered in Newcastle. So there were logistical sort of difficulties in trying to keep track, you know, who was doing what testing, who is going to audit it, and who is going to initiate the second arm of testing. So these are the difficulties we were facing. And the other thing is that when you have different reports, so you have MSI report, you have MMR report, it was actually confusing for clinicians. So even though cases were being picked up as high-risk lynch, because they were being missed by clinicians, they were not being referred to clinical genetics. So our solution was for this was actually adopting a one-stop shop test, which is the MSI Plus, which is part of the National Genomics Test Directory. Um, the only thing about this is that, you know, the costing of trying to prepare the curls is not being addressed because it's not part of the National Genomic Test. But this is what we have used to try to address the complication in the pathway downstream. This is an example of the MSI plus uh, report where it tells you the patient has instability detected. Now, because BRAF is already built into the test, so it doesn't depend on the pathologist to initiate the second arm of test, it tells you immediately that, you know, this patient has increased likelihood of Lynch syndrome. You need to refer the patient to clinical genetics. And the other thing, the bonus thing is that it also has RAS testing built in. So this will be useful for oncologists in terms of deciding, you know, oncological therapy where whether or not the patient is going to benefit from anti-EGFR. This is another example where it is MSI stable, so it's not likely Lynch syndrome, but again, it has the RAS testing built in. So back to the pathway. Because we have uh, put in a one-stop shop test where it is one single clear report, it's much clearer for clinician to action. But we didn't just stop there. So with the tumor board group, 
uh, and the Northern Cancer Alliance, we have also established a gold standard pathway for MDT groups to discuss all the MSI uh, uh, sort of plus reports and to actually document in your MDT, uh, colorectal MDT, when you actually discuss the case. And particularly for cases where the uh, case is high likely to be lynched, we actually have a named responsible clinician documented. So we know exactly who should be acting on those abnormal results. So outcomes. In the last eight months, what we have tested is that we have tested around 1,400 cases, and that is projected to about 2,300 in for a year. As you recall, in 2019, our population for colorectal cancer patients is around this region. So you can imagine if we are not near 100%, we should be around that figure. Now, that's not the end. As I said in the beginning, that the problem is waiting for a cancer diagnosis to a formal dramatic report is more than a year. So this is where mainstreaming comes into place, okay? So mainstreaming is basically diverting the work from clinical genetics to upfront of your pathway, where patients are actually, you know, once they're detected as high-risk lynch to be counseled at the colorectal cancer clinic, the best position, uh, individual in position for these uh, role would be the CNS nurse. Some might argue, you know, the patient could be counseled, you know, at the beginning of the pathway where you are actually be diagnosed correct cancer. They need to be, you know, counseled that potentially they will undergo a formal, you know, gene testing for Lynch syndrome. As part of our mainstreaming work, we have also worked in collaboration with the Clinical Genetic Service. So Dr. Richard Martin and Rebecca Hall have created Lynch information leaflet, not just for patients, but also for clinicians, because clinicians are the ones that will be counselling the patient for testing. Uh, we have also invited Laura from the National Perspective to speak about mainstreaming in our colorectal tumour board group. And finally, out of the eight NHS Foundation Trusts, we have identified two mainstreaming pilot sites of which Tom Lee is uh, leading on the mainstreaming pilot site in November. And this is the point where I would invite Tom Lee. <clears throat> Thanks, Payson. So um, my name is uh, Tom Lee. I'm a gastroenterologist in Northumbria. I'm also the Lynch champion for our MDT and uh, look after our family history of bowel cancer service for the region as well um and yeah I'll, so i'll pick up on the on the on the on the implementation of mainstreaming in northumbria um next slide Payson, have you still got control or has that gone back to going back to emma emma cool emma thank you so um what i'll do is i'll tell you a bit about our drivers for moving towards a mainstreaming model I'll show you a couple of other examples of where it's happened outside the colorectal setting. I'll describe the Northumbria process in a bit more detail and maybe just have a look to the future of where this might take us. Next slide, please. So this um, flow chart is similar to the, the, the flow charts that Payson's been showing, but with some numbers. So this is our, our experience in Northumbria over a five year period um, of all patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer and just showing the various points at which they fall out of um, getting uh, lynch screening uh, one way or another. So um, the barriers are presented in the red boxes on the right hand side. So I'll skip the first two because we've kind of covered them in terms of them not having histology in the first place or the MSI testing not being sent. And I'll focus on the bottom two right hand barriers. So um, out of 1,700 patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer. We picked up 40 um, MSI high BRAF negative uh, patients, but despite the best will in the world, we still found that 10 of those patients or 11 of those patients weren't referred on to genetics. And of those that were, um, 10 of them didn't go on to have genetic testing. So we kind of early on identified that, that there was a problem, not not, not not only at the front end in terms of getting the testing done, but then of making sure the patients got through to getting uh, seeing the right people and getting the tests done. And that's where we started talking about mainstreaming and looking around for alternatives. And obviously the national picture's kind of caught up with us and um, it's very much the thing to do now. So um, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so this was just to say that uh, at the time back in 
pre-pandemic we were putting all of our effort into the front end into getting the uh, getting the MSI test done in the first place um, what we needed to do was look at the the, the back end as well so um, next slide and we'll skip that one thanks so um, so this was the old pathway we had in Northumbria so the MSI test to get done the report would come back to the referring clinician within the MDT um, and at that point uh, the uh, responsible clinician, usually a consultant, would um, see the patient in clinic as part of their routine pathway. And if everyone remembered, would tell the patient that, that MSI status. And if everyone remembered and the patient said yes, they would get referred on to genetics. And then there would be a delay whilst they went to, to see genetics. And obviously, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with that process. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so the model that we've alighted to on um, the, the mainstreaming model uh, is is shown here. So the report lands in the MDT. Um, the MSI result uh, um, lands in the MDT. That is um, picked up by the colorectal nursing team and an appointment set up um, to uh, discuss Lynch gene testing. And that involves includes a family history and some genetic counseling and the blood test is taken at that point and sent off to the regional genetic service. Um, the, the outcome of that comes back into the MDT, um, maybe eight or 12 weeks later. And at that point, the colorectal nurse team share that uh, uh, result with the patient and trigger a referral to genetics at that point. So all the patients who need to end up seeing genetics, but the the whole point of mainstreaming is that the testing is owned and delivered by the by the team looking after the patient. Um, next slide, please. So mainstreaming, uh, you've heard a few definitions of it already, but basically it's shifting the genetic testing into the into the uh, MDT, delivering the care to the patient, um, the, the team closest to the patient rather than referral to the specialist genetic service. It removes the barriers to a formal diagnosis and um, theoretically reduces the time to them seeing genetics. The main thing for us is to reduce that fallout of patients getting their uh, germline testing um, at all. Um, I think there's some secondary benefits, so it's certainly got our MDT talking about um, genomics and uh, uh, MSI. Um, a lot more uh, uh, with a lot more information um, and we, we can't prove this at the moment but we think our patients are going to benefit from it I think it's uh, better for them to get that um, as part of their routine clinical care from people that they're familiar with um, next slide so um, how have we implemented that locally so it's really all down to the work of our um, colorectal nurse specialists, um, they deserve all the credit for this. I'm just here to tell you how wonderful they are. And I don't have a picture of them, I'm afraid, because we didn't have a photo, but they should be getting all the credit. So um, we've been kind of um, working towards this for, for a number of years now, really. they We started off with the idea of having MSI linked nurses, and that was really about increasing testing and sharing the news or the result with them when it came out in order to facilitate the referral to genetics. And we did some education with them right at the outset of that. That was really useful when DPYD testing came along because they were kind of primed and ready to go and they were talking about genomic things already. So that, that was an added benefit. Um, then the pandemic uh, came along and things went on hold for a minute, but we always had had our eye on, on mainstreaming. So next slide. Um, this none of this is new so way back 10 years ago the royal marsden implemented a mainstreaming model for BRCA testing in uh, ovarian cancer pathway and next slide there's a link nurse model um in nottingham published here um around BRCA testing again um so so none of this is kind of uh, necessarily novel it was just new to the colorectal setting um and obviously a lot of this kind of preparatory work has been done in St Mark's and we have benefited from from their expertise and some of the educational material that they have available. Um, next slide. Next slide. Um, as I said, the, the national kind of 
agenda kind of caught up with us and 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 mainstreaming approaches written into the Lynch handbook. So it's something that we should all all be working towards. It's there in black and white. Um, next slide. Uh, so this is our Northumbria process kind of mapped out. So um, step one, the MSI test is done and returned to the MDT MSI high BRAF negative. Um, as Payson's shown, that comes across on the report very clearly stated. Uh, diagnosis of Lynch syndrome is a possibility. Um, at that point, the, MD, the MDT uh, gets the result back and the nurses set up an appointment to see the patient, which can be alongside a routine appointment or as an extra appointment, depending on the timing. And they do a bit of family history and they do a bit of genetic counselling. Um, and I think the key thing with that is that we've kept it as simple as possible. OK, so they don't need to be the colorectal nurses don't need to be um, skilled up like a genetics nurse. They don't need to know everything about Lynch syndrome inside out and um, uh, what have you. It, it's it's another test that they do as part of a whole range of tests as just a few other things that they need to cover off when they have that discussion. At that point, they do the blood test, send it off to the labs, and um, then we wait a few months for the results to come back. We've done five or six patients so far through this process. We started about a month ago and it's really landed very well. As I say, the nurse specialists have taken to it. We've trained up um, uh, four of our six colorectal nurse specialists and they've all um uh yeah yeah um got got stuck into it really enthusiastically um yeah as i say at the moment we're referring all our patients onto genetics regardless of the outcome and we can set up that appointment to try and compress the pathway um when the result comes out uh yeah um next slide so um how did we go about doing this so it's it's been a relatively organic process, but the key thing has been to engage with as many uh, of the interested parties as possible. So it's obviously it's key to be to have the colorectal MDT talking about these things and understanding what what we're trying to do. And I guess that's the role of the Lynch champion. Um, the colorectal specialist nurses, uh, as I say, are the are the key to that. And we found making them MSI link nurses or kind of giving them a bit of ownership of that really helpful. Um, the the logistics of it is delivered by the cancer trackers and the MDT coordinators. So having that, that kind of um, uh, set aside time in the MDT, uh, as Payson alluded to, is really helpful. Um, the lab and pathology are clearly very involved in terms of process. And we've worked closely with our regional genetic service and the genetic counsellors to set the pathway up, but also to deliver the training to the specialist nurses. So we chose to do a kind of local training module rather than the the um, the kind of bespoke package that St Mark's offers, which we felt was a little bit too in-depth and um, uh, uh, full of detail. Um, we went for something a bit more simpler and deliverable um, to to get things up and running. Um, so management have clearly been supportive and the Cancer Alliance have been supportive. We did talk about some funds for this at the outset, but we've done this without any additional funding, um, which is uh, added bonus, I guess. Um, next slide. Uh, last slide. So where where does this go? Obviously, we're one of the pilot sites and there's a similar pilot ongoing in the south of the region. Um, Hopefully, I, I hope um, we all agree it's a success and it'll be rolled out to the other centres and they can learn from our experience. The local education package, I'm sure, will evolve in terms of skilling up the MDTs and the nurse specialists. And I suspect that, as people have alluded to, mainstreaming will move into other areas of the colorectal MDT and other cancer sites. And there may be other settings within <clears throat> in the colorectal uh, field where we can bring the germline genetic testing further uh, forward in the pathway. Thank you. That's been absolutely brilliant, Tom, and thank you so much for sharing the Northumbria experience and also to, to Payson who um, delivered um, before your talk. I think it's brilliant that 
you know, when, when you were explaining about the nursing um, team, about how they are able to facilitate those genetic testing, that, you know, this is about upskilling, isn't it? And like developing that knowledge and skills base. It's not taking over roles of genetic counsellors because they're, they're, they're distinct levels differences but there's definitely with the increased demand for the 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 um you know that counseling there's um really really um exciting value there going forward there's been quite a few questions in the chat and i noticed that payson's been able to answer a few of them so we've got actually quite a bit of time now to go to the chat. So I'm going to go back in time and say, so first of all, Jessica, you asked a question, um, Jessica Deloma Olson, you asked a, a question of what is the rate of false negatives of MMR testing? Um, so uh, Payson, I think that was either yourself um, yeah, sorry, yeah. I answered it wrongly. It's the other way around. So the sensitivity, I think, is around 95%. But Nick may be able to share because I think Nick has more experience in this. But I think they are comparable, though. The MMR uh, and MSI, they are comparable sort of screening tests. But yeah, it's not 100%, but it's above high 90s. Okay. So, uh, Jessica, hope hopefully. Um, hopefully that's answered your question. Um, Nick, did you want to pose uh, the question that you put in the chat at five thirty-three about um, the cases that are referred for germline? Did you want to develop that question? I'm not sure if Nick is able to speak because I think his microphone is disabled. But essentially. Oh. He yeah, so he said that in his 3,000 patient cancer colorectal series, 2.9% had indication for germline testing after IC and BRAF and methylation, suggesting that there's vast majority. And he, they never got feedback in pathology uh, in terms of like, you know, what's the rate. If I'm not mistaken, I think Kevin Monaghan in National Lynch Project has mentioned it before that, you know, nationally it's about same 3%. Uh, but I think they are expecting seven to eight percent, so we are quite a shortfall as a group. Right, lovely. Okay, thank you, Nick. Sorry, we've um, enabled your mic now, so um, that's brilliant. And I've seen that you've popped in about you agree with the ninety-five percent um, estimate there, so that's great. Um, we've also got another question in from Jessica which I think Deborah's managed to answer that and um, that there's a an audit planned to look at this in clinical genetics in Leeds is that right Jessica uh, Emma if you could disable the mics um for those people who have asked the question please and again Jonathan Berry if you wanted to ask your question about MSI Marie, so, unfortunately, um, I don't think it's working. Um, I tried oh, it not to worry, not to worry. I, I was going to say Jessica's question. The first time I read it, I may have misinterpreted. So I think she, what she's asking is that why is gene testing not done in the first test, for example, like blood? And I think um, the first time when I read it, I thought that she meant why do we not just do germline testing in blood? And I think if to do germline testing in all blood is actually not cost effective, hence you always have a screening test. But I may have misinterpreted. She may have meant that why do we test on blood instead of uh, pathological samples? But I think if it is that the, the latter, and I think this has come into place because of the dual role of MMR status. So we know that oncologists use it not just for Lynch syndrome screening, but they also use it for immune oncological treatment. And if it is for the latter, you need to have confirmatory cancer and you can't necessarily get that in blood. Whereas, you know, germline, we know that it's in every single cell. So if it is for Lynch screening, then it's fine. But actually, we know that the reason why we do it on confirmed cancer is because of the dual role of MMR status. Lovely. Thanks, Peyton. Jackie? Yeah, um, I perhaps add, because I suppose another way of interpreting the question would be, well, why don't we, everybody with bowel cancer, why just, don't we just do a germline blood test on them? 
Um, and the reason that we don't is that um, there is huge variation within the human genome. So if you do ge genetic germline testing on somebody who actually has a very low prior risk of having that genetic condition, what you're more likely to find is an um, uninterpretable variant than anything else. That is not helpful to patients. So what we do not want to do is um, just muddy the water and find a load of variants we can't interpret on patients. So we are far better targeting genetic testing to those patients where there is a significant risk that they have binge. Because if we do that, if we find anything, it's far more likely to be a pathogenic and significant variant. Right. That's, that's great, Jackie. Thank you. And again, it goes back to patient expectation as well, doesn't it? Um, you know, being able to manage that in a realistic way. Um, Nick, I see that you've put something else in the chat and I think I've unmuted you if you wanted to ask your question. Nope. OK. Any questions for Tom before we move on? Do you hear me? Hello, Jessica. You, we've got Hello. you now. Lovely. <laughs> this is great because we do lose something in the translation of the, the, the written <laughs> thing. It's, it's easy to have a conversation. You're very, very welcome. Would you I like to ask to... your question? Yeah, like I, I just wanted to, to say thank you and that like this has been super interesting and uh, I think I did get lost sometimes in translation uh, or like in, in text. So I just wanted to say thank you for for like the patience on the chat and that I'm I'm more on the diagnostic side. So that's why I was asking those things, but I'm I'm quite new in the field. So that's maybe why sometimes I also got even more lost. But my questions. I think you did understand them, but it was more like what I understood when you do this type of MMR, MSI tests, since it is proteomics, you might have issues with the assay per se. So that's why I was asking more like if you have any clinical experience in which if it's negative, can it be due to that false negative per se? So, but then I think uh, I think Jackie was commenting that then that disadvantage of genomics is these variants that cannot be interpreted. But I feel like you end up in uh, like finding a balance. So that that was my question. I just wanted to highlight that. I think that, I followed and uh, thanks for disabling my <laughs> or like that maybe. That's <laughs> brilliant. That's great. And Jessica, where are you, where are you? Where where are you working? So as I said, I'm working more on diagnostics. So like I, I joined, it, it, we work, um, it's a private company that develops kits. So I don't want to take over necessarily. Like, I, I'm pro scientist. I, I'm more from the PhD research side, but now I'm working in a diagnostics company. Okay. So that's why I wanted to understand a bit like how it actually worked in, in practice when it comes to testing on the clinical setting. Because at the end of the day, like you were saying with like the patient is in the middle. so. I needed to understand a bit like is I thought Jackie's contribution about the bus, the variants of uncertain significant was right. really valuable. So that's Lovely. my background. <laughs> Thank you. And Jackie, um, go back to yourself. So so I think is MMR testing, is MSI testing a hundred percent effective at picking up all the Lynch syndrome patients? It's very good, but no, it isn't hundred percent effective. So we have a various safety nets in place as well, which are covered by the National Test Directory. The first is that we will offer germline testing to any patient diagnosed under 40, even if they are MSI stable or, or MMR proficient. Um, and that's one of our safety nets because we all feel uncomfortable when we've got a 25 year old and we're not offering germline testing, even though the somatic uh, nerve pathology suggests it's not Lynch. Um, how many do we pick up on that, that route? I, I can't remember picking up one via that route. Um, it, is, it is very unusual to, to miss it. Our other safety net is family history. So again, if um, a patient has a very strong family history, particularly of early onset colorectal or endometrial cancer, 
again, we would offer that individual germline testing, even if um, the pathology did not suggest it was Lynch. These are the ones that are better off, I think, coming through clinical genetics because there's a number of clinical decisions to be made about who we're going to test. Um, but no, it's not perfect, but we do have some safety nets in place. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Jackie, for um, pulling that back, um, that discussion. That's great. So um, thank you very much to everybody who posed questions. And again, thank you for the last session um, led by Payson and Tom. So we're delighted now that we're going to be able to pass the baton over to Stuart Rundle and I'll allow Stuart to introduce himself. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Marie. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for um, tuning in and listening. Um, my name is Stuart Rundle. I'm one of the gynaecological cancer surgeons in, um, in Gateshead as part of the regional uh, gynaecological cancer service um, and also joint lead with Holly Buist, who's a consultant pathologist in Newcastle and I believe is on the call as well uh, for the regional Lynch syndrome project um, in gynaecological cancer. Um, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, implementation of our um, IHC testing pathways and the results of that um, that we've audited a couple of times over the last couple of years. Um, but I wanted to give some credit um, up front to some other people because I might forget to mention them as we move through things. So Handan um, Yilmaz Parta was a clinical research fellow and Ben Wormald is a, one of our senior trainees in gynecological cancer surgery here at Gateshead um, who did the majority of the back of the sort of legwork um, on the audits I'm going to present um, but also really important to the development of the pathways are uh, Holly um, as I have mentioned and also Angela Rate, uh, consultant pathologist here at Gateshead um, you know really key to getting this implemented uh, in time um, for the for the ask as set out by NICE, uh, Rachel O'Donnell for clinical input into the pathway uh, and also to Richard Martin who's obviously been mentioned already um, from a northern genetic service point of view. Um, the situation in gynaecological cancer is slightly different um, to what we've heard in, in colorectal cancer. We have a, a smaller proportion of patients and we have a much more centralised um, management. So all of the gynaecological cancers in the northeast um, and North Cumbria are managed through three specialist, uh, was to now three specialist gynaecological cancer MDTs um, based at James Cook in Gateshead um, and also in Newcastle. Um, and I'm going to present you some audit data um, for the largest of those MDTs, um, which is based in Gateshead and captures uh, patients um, basically through all of south of Tyne, um, Sunderland, South Tyneside, the northern part of County Durham and Darlington, uh, North Cumbria, Northumbria, um, uh, everything basically that comes through the QE path um, labs. Um, so this means that we probably have had a bit more success in our upfront testing, but poses different challenges when it comes to mainstreaming, um, as I will as I will allude to um, as we move on. So go to the next slide, please. So just as a brief recap, uh, the rationale for screening testing endometrial cancer uh, is that endometrial cancer can be a Lynch associated cancer and endometrial cancer may be regarded as a sentinel cancer uh, with an age of onset that can be typically up to 10 years earlier than colorectal cancer. So universal testing in endometrial cancer is likely to increase the diagnosis of uh, LS patients and provide opportunities for intervention for these patients for prevention of future cancers, but also preventative strategies in their at-risk families. Um, and this is all sort of summarised and laid out in DG42, which was published in October 2020. Uh, and really it was with Holly and Angela that we developed the pathway uh, in response to understanding that this was going to be um, published and uh, the ask was for implementation in early 2021, um, which we were able to do. Um, and whilst others have gone into the challenges of funding, etc., I'll not touch on that too much, but to say that some magic was performed um, to enable the funding for universal MMR IHC uh, to be started, particularly in Gateshead. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, unlike colorectal cancer, where there appears to be, I'm not an expert in colorectal cancer, but a split between MMR IHC and MSI testing is almost ex exclusively undertaken through MMR IHC in endometrial cancer. Um, and I don't wish to um, teach everybody what they already know, uh, but essentially we're looking for the absence of one of four key proteins involved in mismatch repair, which is one of 
the cell DNA damage repair mechanisms. Um, these are MSH2, MSH6, MLH1 and PMS2, and they usually exist as dimeric pairs. Absence of MSH2, MSH6 implies a risk of uh, Lynch syndrome and germline intestine is required. Absence of PMS2, which is isolated similarly, but absence of MLH1 requires an additional testing step uh, with MLH1 promoter hypermethylation studies. And this is a potential weak point of the pathway as these studies uh, have taken a little while to get back uh, a number of weeks in the past, but that time does seem to be decreasing um, as we move through uh, 2022. Um, so next slide, please. Oh, I should say that the testing is ideally done on a diagnostic biopsy. Um, this really provides um, an opportunity uh, for the diagnosing clinician to um, give the result, um, but also as we move towards the um, molecular characterization of endometrial cancer, which is separate to the identification of Lynch syndrome, uh, it may also provide um, rationale and insight into how we should uh, potentially de-radicalize surgery or de-escalate adjuvant treatment um, for these uh, patients as uh, new guidance and new evidence comes online. So in response to the uh, NICE guidance, um, we set up and wrote a a guidance document which is probably many pages too long and can be summarized in this pathway uh, for patients which be embedded into practice um, within uh, the northern part of the Northern Cancer Alliance um, gynecological oncology footprint uh, through 2021 um, with a bit of heavy input from myself and others to ensure that the communication of the testing and referral of patients was happening um, and then sort of at the end of that we presented some audit data initially our update day in March 2022 which was quite a nice evening attended by about 70 delegates from around the region and was a uh, the first face-to-face -face meeting we had for quite a while when we came out of Covid so that was uh, really well received. Uh, next slide please. Um, so in that we did basically an audit of practice of the implementation through Q1 to Q3 a little bit into Q4 of 2021 through the QEH um, path and uh, our gynecological cancer MDT. Um, and we did this retrospectively looking at the MDT record uh, and the patient records. Um, the standards were obviously laid out uh, in NICE DG42 and we expected 100% compliance with screening test discussion at MDT um, and onward referral to clinical genetics as appropriate. So the next slide please. Um, within the audit period we identified 141 new epithelial endometrial cancers um, and with a couple of excep exceptions with really good reasons um, we've achieved basically 100% intention to test over the initial implementation period um, which was obviously very pleasing. Um, we weren't so good at making sure that these cases were discussed um, at the gynecology MDT um, this was often due to MLH1 promoter hypermethylation studies not um, being available um, for the sort of final pathology and adjuvant treatment discussion um, and due to the time pressures and the sheer number of patients that we have um, through the central regional MDT it's difficult to justify relisting these patients um, for matters that don't affect their adjuvant treatment. Um, but we asked the referring clinicians to refer to the clinical guidance and that they appeared to do um, as we had 100% compliance with eligible patients being referred onwards um, to clinical genetics for germline testing, um, which was um, obviously really pleasing to see that the document that we had formulated was working. Um, so that was an implementation period. Can have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Lovely. Uh, and so I guess there was a risk that we would sort of falter in terms of ongoing practice, particularly if we had less input from those of us who are regarded as Lynch champions in the uh, in the MDT. Um, but we did have an established clinical guideline that seemed to be working and we had increasing experience and engagement from our um, unit lead clinician surgeons. 
Um, so we went back um, and we've done a, a what has been described as a quick and dirty audit of ongoing practice recently uh, through the QE path and the MDT as well. Um, and if we can have the next slide, please, um, we can see that through the first half of 2022, so really during established practice, um, we've maintained an intention to test rate of 97%. And actually those few ones that are creeping outside, not being detected, a uh, proportion of them are coming from sources outside of the NHS um, and it's difficult to understand um, why they're not being tested um, simply due to lack of access to the records. Um, I'm sure Holly won't mind me saying that um, in the other uh, side of the Tyne in Newcastle uh, where they're also undertaking testing um, over a similar period of time with a s only a very slightly smaller number of patients they also have a hundred percent testing record so we can be fairly certain um, that across the northern patch of the NCA as far as gynecological cancer endometrial cancer at least goes um, that we're capturing well in excess of 98 uh, percent of test of endometrial cancers getting MMR IHC um, which is obviously very pleasing and a bit of a success story for our um, pathway implementation um, so if you come to the next slide in conclusion as I said, we've got an established practice with high uptake. Um, we've got good clinical understanding and buy-in from our surgeons who are referring patients into the MDT and then delivering the results. Um, we do obviously have large numbers of IHC tests going on to identify small numbers of patients who are at risk of Lynch syndrome. And this really in the gynecological cancer setup and in particular with a way with the hub and spoke model of gynecological cancer treatment, it does make the mainstreaming argument more difficult than it might be in colorectal cancer. You know, we've seen that the current rate of LS associated endometrial cancer means that it's potentially a once per year event uh, to see these patients amongst treating surgeons and their associated CNS teams. And when I see, say CNS teams, we're usually talking about one CNS um, in, a, in a gynecological cancer unit. Um, and thus far, Richard Martin and the team at Northern Genetic Service have been very happy to take the referrals um, because they are small numbers. However, uh, I'm increasingly convinced listening to the the arguments of the benefits of mainstreaming and actually we probably have an opportunity to reconsider how all of our endometrial cancer pathways happen and this is going to be resp in response to molecular characterization but also in response to the need to consider whether we need to stage even what might be considered low grade low risk cancers differently and we are in the middle of a pathway reorganization and it might be that the way to achieve mainstream streaming is to do something like cohorting these at-risk patients who are identified as dmmr on their diagnostic biopsy through one site um, and then you know allowing mainstreaming happen to happen with a team that is used to doing it so you know that's something that's for the future um, and certainly we've discussed, you know, amongst the gynecological Lynch team um, that, you know, this is something that we now aspire to. So um, that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. Um, to take any questions. Absolutely brilliant. Um, it's, and it's great to be able to see the, the, the numbers of the audit there. It really is. And um, yeah, so thank you so much. And again, the volumes of endometrial, they just don't compare currently, do they, no. with the colorectal no, numbers? So not. it's like um, it's apples and oranges, isn't it, yeah, really? Yeah, but yeah. yeah, watch this space. It's great. So I am delighted that if anybody's got any questions for Stuart, if you could pop them in the in the chat there, please, because we're delighted to be able to move on to the last section of the um, the subject focused for this evening and that's the discussion about the regional expert network so without further ado I'm going to pass you back over to Jackie and Sally um, to discuss what it looks like what do we need what do we want etc thanks Sally thanks very much Marie um, hopefully you can hear me now properly uh, next slide so 
Um, this is part of the project you've heard about. It's been now running up, up, coming up to two years, and this is about hoping and helping the ways to sustain it beyond the life cycle of the project. Um, various people have talked about money, and obviously that's part of it, but it's about embedding it within the whole system that you've got. And the uh, Association of Medical Royal Colleges have recommended a kind of three tier approach in your MDTs for genomic disease management. So if we looked at that mapping to our um, NEY GMSA or Cancer Alliance geographies, within that three tiered structure, we've got the national oversight, which obviously um, is the St Mark's Centre in London. And then there are seven NHS England regional um, areas and that would map therefore to seven regional centres for Lynch syndrome. And locally we'd have Lynch syndrome champions, which several people have also mentioned tonight, within each local cancer multidisciplinary teams. And your Cancer Alliances I know have been going round asking for nominations for that role. And um, we will try and ask you because uh, it's possible we can pump prime something or um, with the indicative endorsement from NHSC, there may be then ongoing funding and supporting that. And on your top bar, there's a Slido S, which at that point to ask you what you think is the most important thing you would like us to sort of support with any pump prime mon money in this uh, way. Next slide. So this is a schematic um, from the Academy of Me Medical Royal Colleges and the Lynch Syndrome champions who are local team in the pale blue dots would be the ones ensuring that the pathway is actually set up and running within your MDT, might look at other interventions and just let people know, signpost them towards them and undertake a regular CPD in the Lynch Syndrome arena. Your central um, pink dot um, is the St Mark's Centre in terms of Lynch syndrome. And then the purple dots would be the regional expert centres. And these are multidisciplinary groups managing the more complex cases within the region. And one of the questions we're wondering is whether in, in any why it's a very large area, as people have been describing, does that mean just one for any why or would it be one per cancer alliance that might be more appropriate for the region? Next slide. This is the membership the Academy and the National Centre are recommending or asking the sorts of um, professionals that would be involved in it. But I, I think they've um, missed oncology off in terms of Lynch syndrome. It would be quite important. Um, next slide. And the sort of key principles they're looking to are ongoing monitoring equity of the access for patients getting the Lynch syndrome testing, possibly supporting any mainstream pathways, but then for those groups that are doing it in sort of sharing across the way to ensure the consistency for anyone who is doing mainstreaming and how you uh, achieve that. And then ongoing care potentially. And it's basically supporting all sorts of groups of clinical teams involved with Lynch syndrome, cancer MDTs, obviously at this stage we're talking about, um, the mainstreaming pathways and also any other family history service or primary care. Now the East um, area colorectal team have estimated a cost and a business case for putting together one regional network which holds a virtual MDT around 75,000 annual cost. So if we do get that money uh, through as routine from NHSE that will be great but otherwise it is quite a large cost. So next slide thanks. Obvious benefits, supporting that consistency across the patch, um, managing any complex results such as um, all these abnormal variants that Jackie's much, much keener on <laughs> and able to interpret um, any sorts of audits across regions, supporting people and 
potentially an electronic platform and pathway coordination across the sort of wider region as well to, to support that consistency. So there are seven items um, that they've put forward. So these are the seven that we'd like you, if we can pump prime something, what would be the most important, do you think, for your MDT in this arena? So that multidisciplinary, perhaps more as an informal group, which will be linked into clinical genetics, but more multidisciplinary to be able to discuss the complex questions providing support in the mainstream arena so that getting more teams on board uh, an electronic platform. Next slide. An actual virtual accessible MDT meeting so you can turn up and discuss any complex cases and learn from other people's discussion. Dedicated pathway coordinators and internal audit and research across the patch and having clear governance arrangements. Now, I think as a given, they are going to be clear governance arrangements. So I don't think that it's a priority, but it's not something we're going to be able to vote on in the end. So the list on the next slide are your seven things. Um, you can vote on that S at the top. If it doesn't open for you, uh, there should be a list of seven things. You can click on one. If it doesn't open for you, you can go to slido.com with that number, enter the system to, to vote. It should be appearing for you in your browser. So we'll give you some time and leave that open as well. That's question one. And hopefully uh, some of you have been able to access and read the um, material that we put there um, or you can read it afterwards, obviously. That was the first question. Uh, next slide. The question, second question was, as we've gone round, we haven't found any evidence of an existing formal Lynch syndrome network, but if you are aware of them, uh, can you type that in the chat, chat for us? or if you're aware of an informal network of uh, clinicians who do get together and discuss complex Lynch syndrome cases, working either locally or, or within your specialty field across the country, um, that would also be very helpful to know. And I say, we can pump prime some elements at this stage, but we're not sure yet how the funding will be sustained if that affects your decision making. Um, so how are we doing for time? Could we leave a yep. couple of minutes while people just have a go we at those? In, we can indeed. Um, so if anybody's struggling with Slido, if you open it in Google Chrome, that should um, support Slido. Um, failing that, particularly, Jonathan, I see that you've popped in the chat. If you want to answer the question, if you could go back, um, yeah, put please the Emma slide to where the seven the seven options are. Do you want to write a number in the chat? Is that what you're yeah. thinking? <laughs> so Jonathan, if you see that there now, if you would like to if you wanted to put a vote on where you think. Payson, thank you. So if nobody's got the Slido opening, we've only got 14 people that have voted currently. In the, And again, this as a GMSA gives us some good guidance on, on what your thinking is and what where you see the priorities. So thank you so much, everybody, for, for involving. Unable to open the link. Again, um, that's Angela. Would you like to pop your option into the chat? and we can collate those at the end. So you've got seven answers. And we've had 16 voting so far. It's a bit like Strictly, isn't it, on a Saturday? <laughs> I'm not quite Anton Deck um, calibre, though. I do apologise. OK. Hey, John, John, it's absolutely not a procedurally valid way of making investments and funding allocation decisions. That's not so much of a problem at the moment, so we have no funding to allocate. Um, yeah. Good well, point, Jackie. Yes. But um, I think what we're really just trying to do is get an idea of what people might find valuable. Yeah. Um, 
I, I knew what I think I might be valuable. I, I, I think a, a forum that people can just bring cases, difficult cases. Most of the time, it's going to be fairly obvious what you're going to do in terms of treatment. But there are cases where I think it might be valuable. It, it, some, some of these genetic results are really complex. Um, we're just giving you the easy stuff. But it would be nice to have a forum to explain to clinicians some of the more complicated, really complicated stuff that is coming through. Um, to give you a flavour of that, we have got a family that have Lynch. Um, and what is happening is hypermethylation of all genes. They've got an inherited epigenetic cause for their Lynch syndrome. That doesn't even get into the textbooks. Um, and that would, I think it would be helpful to have a forum to help um, the clinicians understand what we think is going on, but difficult cases where decisions are having to be made about maybe, you know, maybe we should be thinking about prophylactic surgery and things like that. And, and if so, what would be the best method? Just areas where you can just call on somebody who might have a good expertise in that area to, for some advice. So if we just pop on to the next slide. Um, we appreciate we've been trying to squeeze so much in tonight. Well, this is not what we'd call a discussion, really. So it would be leading on from that. Anyone who's interested to just join another discussion at some point um, on proposals, you know, such as do nothing, that's not going to help anyone or any patients. Um, but you have to put it in for your option appraisals, obviously. And um, whether we're looking at possibly just um, embedding it within one trust or cancer alliance in the future or something across the whole patch at this stage, as Jackie's alluded to, it's going to be very much informal. But over time, there may be possibility of developing governance arrangements. Obviously, we're not going to take over any sort of local services. Um, it's more about just advice, really, I think. Um, the next slide might be the last one. Yeah, so if, if you are interested in joining that sort of discussion or just um, putting forward some ideas towards it, again, could you just pop your name in the chat and we'll get back to you with another uh, call probably or uh, an, a meeting at some point. In the near future, we're meant to do, uh, we'll be finishing the project by uh, the end of March, uh, unless it's taken forward again by the genomics unit. So uh, this is about sort of making something sustainable for northeastern Yorkshire. So that's great. And I think that is then just to thank you all. Thank all the speakers. Thank you for attending. Thank you for participating, particularly because it is a little bit like sort of shouting into the dark, sometimes wondering um, how things are going on. Um, oh, new regional Lynch educator. Can you enable her camera? They have to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> so um, before we just sign off for the, 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 the evening, we have got Rebecca We've got Amy and we have got Karen, who are all your new Lynch nurse educators. So these are really experienced clinical nurse specialists who are now going to be joining the Northeastern Yorkshire GMSA as um, Lynch nurse educators. So they're going to be reaching out and um, being able to see you know what's going on in your own area within your own trust and things like that so if you are able to get your cameras on ladies it'll be great to see you but don't worry if you can't i missed one of the names um amy there's rebecca. amy what's the what's the other person amy rebecca. amy rebecca and karen so amy do you want to introduce yourself quickly and say which cancer alliance region you're doing Hello everyone, my name's Amy and I'm uh, in the South Yorkshire and Bassett Law um, Alliance. Lovely, thanks Amy. If we've got Rebecca on call. Sorry about the unmuting and things like that. It's been a little bit of a problem this evening. Um, not to worry. There's, there's Karen. Hi Karen. Hi, hi Marie. Um, yeah, I'm Karen. I'm going to be um, the Lynch nurse for North Yorkshire and um, 
North Yorkshire and Humberside. Sorry, I'm still trying to remember. I only started on Monday. <laughs> yeah, um, only yeah, third I'm day. I'm looking forward to being part of the project. Very yeah. exciting. Great Brilliant. To meet you. And then we've also got um, Rebecca, who I think might have accidentally dropped off call. But yeah, so we're, we're here covering the whole region. So please get in touch. And as, as Sally says, um, if you want to get involved in further um, discussions about the regional um, expert, then please drop a, an expression of interest in the chat. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today and especially our speakers. So with Jackie, for Sally, um, for Payson, for Tom, for Stuart. And honestly, thank you so much for all the questions as well. They've been really, really interesting. So safe home if you're already there or if you're not already there. And thank you so much, everybody. Take care and good night. Thanks, Marie. Thank you. Thank you.